Casey Johnson with us on Knocking Doors Down. How are you today, ma'am? I'm doing great. I've been running kids from field hockey to swim on this gorgeous North Carolina day, and things are going well. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. How are you handling this pandemic? How are you dealing with the homeschooling and all that good stuff? Because I know my sister's about to pull her hair out. So how are you feeling? <laughs> homeschooling for kids has not been um, my favorite. Mostly because I'm an introvert and now there's people around me all the time and I oh, just yeah. can't ever get that moment to myself. <laughs> uh, well, you're doing great, which I want to get into a little bit later in our conversation because your blog on your website is excellent and you've talked a lot about things that you are doing with your kids and uh, uh, we were talking before we started recording here about being a single dad and I brought up uh, filling your buckets and so We'll talk about that a little bit later on, but um, tell us about, about Casey as a, as a little girl. What was the life growing up like for you? I know there are some, some pinpoint stuff that eventually led you to transferring to the Columbine High School, um, which, you know, we'll focus on that a little bit, but, but what was life like for you? You seem like such a sweet, jovial woman that I, I just picture this, this cute little girl out there playing and, you know. Um, so I grew up in Colorado with my parents, my sister, and two brothers. And actually I was really quiet and timid and shy as a little girl. Um, usually I would have been hiding behind my mom's legs if we were out in public. Um, <laughs> but life was great. I had a really easy childhood, um, just a great family to be around. And I started showing horses when I was eight. Mm -hmm. And that definitely became my passion, um, the animals, just gave me such confidence and helped me really grow in who I was and my abilities to kind of step outside things that made me comfortable, step outside my comfort zone. Um, so I really became passionate about showing and competing on my horses and trying to get to the world championship level. So that was pretty much my focus. Between that and following my little brother and his hockey career, we were a busy bunch. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you're right. Things started to change when I was a sophomore in high school is when I started to run into a little bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what trouble kind of occurred there? What was Such it just as... uh, peer pressure? What, what was uh, happening? That, uh... Um, so I started hanging out with a group of friends that maybe I wouldn't have normally hung out with up to that point. And within that group of friends was this boy who became one of my very best friends came home from school one day to learn that he had committed suicide oh. and I mean I just I fell to my knees crying it was completely unexpected um, I mean I just was so broken and so lost and confused and angry about it and really you're not supposed to lose your friends when you're 15 and right. so there was a lot for our group of friends to work through and a month after he died his best guy friend did the same thing. So within a month's time, we lost two friends to suicide. And I'm sure you've heard that there kind of is the snowball effect with teen suicide. It's yeah. awful. And it kind of seemed, seemed and felt that way in our group. I think because we were so confused and we kept leaning on each other in all the unhealthy ways. We didn't have healthy coping mechanisms and we were shoving everybody who wanted to help us, like our parents and teachers or youth pastors or whoever, we were pushing them away thinking, we got this. You have no idea what's going on. We're handling it when really we weren't. And it came to the point where I had my own suicide planned um, oh, wow. for an upcoming Sunday at three o'clock in my parents' barn in their backyard. And I'm not sure how my parents caught word of this, Somehow I must have told my friend and then she went to my parents, but they completely took over my life at that point. Obviously, I was out of control and couldn't help myself or fight for myself. And they ended up doing that for me by taking me out of school, making me sleep on the floor in their room, going to counseling and really just controlling me when I couldn't tr control myself. And I absolutely hated them for it for like six weeks straight. It would, I wouldn't talk to my parents at all. <laughs> I wouldn't respond to them. I wouldn't look at them. And now looking back, of course, they did the right thing. And I'm so thankful that they loved me when it was hard. Sure. And um, 
really helped to pull me out of that pit of despair. And I'm sure it's a, it's one of those lessons now that you're a parent of, of four, right? It's a three girls and one boy. Yes. Yeah. I hope that I can love when it's hard, like, right. you know, and that's give really the real love when it's really hard to choose. And that's really what it is, is that, the, that the, we, we as parents have to have that defense of my kid hates me, uh, or at least in their words, right now. But when they become 20, 21, 22, the life lessons learned yeah. forward, is that, that love's going to come back around and, oh, mom, mom and dad were right on that. That's what we hope, right? <laughs> <laughs> we hope. So how did this then transition your parents have you out of school? Um, were you able to start getting some sort of a, a therapy? Any were there any kind of groups for for grieving and that kind of stuff at that time? Because I I know so well with my addiction pulling away. You know, it went from the the good time drinking with everyone to uh, isolation and then the depression. And then I can relate to having a plan of suicide and stuff like that. So was was there were you getting some sort of help or was that just not something that was talked about at that time because this is probably around what 95 94 um it was offered to me and i went right this was 98 okay um is when the suicides happened going on and my parents did take me to counseling um I didn't do great with counseling because I felt like I was sitting in front of somebody who was just going to respond with what they were obligated to say. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like sitting in front of them that they actually had an understanding of where I was coming from. I felt like as the sassy teenager I was saying, did you just lose two friends to suicide? Then you have no idea what I'm going through. Um, sure. And that's really sassy. I understand but that's, that's how I felt. And because of that, my parents really, again, just took that control. And the only places they would let me go were to the barn to ride my horse and to church. And they would drive me there and wait outside to make sure I didn't sneak off and take me home. And within about six weeks of their takeover of my life, <laughs> I just kind of surrendered. I think I realized I needed everything that they were giving me. Yeah. All the shelter and support. And I just kind of fell into it one night and spent three hours sobbing and pouring it all out to my parents, um, everything that I'd felt. And after that night, everything got better, like almost instantaneously, because I was able to release it all finally and feel safe doing so. Um, then I was able to recover and work through the grief in a much more healthy way. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And it, and it just, just goes to show, much, uh, to show. We, we talk a lot here about the importance of, of mentorship in any regard and, uh, you know, be that your parents or someone else or, you know, grief counseling. And um, it is, it's such an imperative part. And of course, we'll get into that a little bit later of, of how you're doing work. But um, so, so when is the time when your family decides that uh, it's time to, to return to regular school, to public school? Um, so after that night that I poured everything out, they kind of started to give me more freedom as they could trust me, right? <laughs> so they would let me go to school and then my mom would be checking on me throughout the day to make sure I was at school and I was hanging out with the right people who they knew would help me continue in a positive direction. But by that point, there was only a month left of the school year. So I really just got through it and went back to showing my horses through the summer. Um, and then that August, we lost a third boy in that group of friends. Oh my gosh. Um, very unexpectedly from cancer, a side effect from his cancer treatment. And at that point, I realized I needed a new start. I need mm -hmm. to go to a new school. I need a fresh start. So my best friend, Lindsay, from the barn went to Columbine. And that's why I transferred over there for my junior year. Yeah. And so how, once you started at Columbine, how, how was the environment for you? Were you starting to feel that you were prospering at that point or you were engaging with a new positive crowd and, and, and kind of integrating and finding yourself? I think I just didn't become very involved at school because I was so focused on competition with my horse. So I didn't go to the football games, the basketball games. I didn't really engage a lot. Not that it was bad. I had several friends just from being around the school. But really, I had my agenda, and that was sure. to get to the world championships that next summer. Um, so it was a fine. It was fine. 
fiscal year up until the spring of 99. So after your parents kind of gave you a little bit more leeway and whatnot, when your third friend had passed away, did they kind of get back a little closer and be like, oh, kind of got to keep an eye on you again a little bit or? Yes, for sure. They were really nervous when um, Andy died. That's the third boy. Mm -hmm. They thought I was going to spiral right back down into that pit. Right. But I was surrounded by really positive friends and um, a lot of my church friends actually through the summer. Right. And I think I handled it really well in a much different way than I handled the first two. And a lot of that had to do with who I was allowing to surround me. Right. Absolutely. So we go into the spring of, of 99. Um, if you could just briefly, because we don't want to touch on it too much, you know, we fill people in on, on, on what has occurred if they didn't know your story, but could you take us through the day a little bit of how it was for you? 5150 is power. The power to overcome. The power to persevere. The power to set your life on a course for success. When you're faced with the challenges life throws at you, you focus and do what is needed to go beyond what is required. So stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness knocking doors down along the way. We are 5150. So the actual day of Columbine started um, really great, actually. Two days before, on the Sunday, I had solidified my qualifications to get into the world championships that summer. So I was like riding cloud nine. I was so excited. I had a great weekend of competition. And as I was walking out the door that Tuesday morning, something told me to go back and tell my mom that I loved her, which isn't common. Not that I didn't love my mom, but just for me to take the time to go back and do that was odd. So I listened to that little something and turned around and yelled, love you, mom. And she said, love you, Case. And I went to school. And the morning went like any, every, any other morning until the lunch hour, I went to the locker that Lindsay and I shared together because every day that year we would meet at our locker and drive to my mom's for lunch because she would have sandwiches and cookies waiting for us. Well, I couldn't find Lindsay that day. So I wandered the halls looking for her, went to her math class, kind of tried to figure out where she was. And by the time I walked in front of the library to go to the car by myself, I realized I wouldn't make it home on time. So I just went into the library, grabbed a seat at the back with a gossip magazine just to kill some time. <laughs> yeah, for the only day that year. And a few minutes after sitting down, um, I heard some noises outside, which I've never really heard a gun before then. Um, and we looked outside and didn't see anything. But a minute or two later, the teacher came running into the school, screaming at us to get our heads under the tables and to hide because there were boys outside with guns. And for just a moment, I'm looking around thinking this can't be real. And the way she kept screaming and the panic in her voice made it obvious that this was very real and this was happening right now. So I got up and went about 10 feet in front of me. There was a long line of um, it was like a long table sectioned off with computers on top. So little sections. And I picked a spot and pulled a chair next to me and thought, I have the very best hiding spot. They're not going to see me here. And a few minutes later, the shooters came into the library, started shooting, started yelling, laughing, telling people to stand up, telling us all this was our day to die. And as I'm hiding under there, just shaking, I just started praying. I mean, I don't know what else there is to say, but God help us. I'm, yeah. I'm just sitting there completely helpless. And and they say that it, pictures of your life go through when you're facing death, go through your mind. And that's exactly what happened. It was like a slideshow of my life. Our family in Mexico, me at the barn with my horse, watching brother hockey. Um, and as I was praying, I felt like I got punched in the stomach as the boys kept getting closer. And a second later, I felt a hand on my back. And I thought, nobody fits under here with me. Who could that be? So I turned around to look over my left shoulder and there was nobody there, but I still felt the hand on my back. And I just knew after that, that I was gonna be shot. I didn't know if I was gonna live or die, but I felt complete peace with whatever that was gonna be and really just waited my turn. And another minute or two later, I looked over my right shoulder and there was a shooter knelt down pointing a 12 gauge 
sawed off shotgun at the boy behind me. And I knew that they were gonna kill him. He didn't have a chair to protect him. And I knew also that I would be next. So I turned around, plugged my ears and crouched down. I remember the shot that killed the boy hiding behind me. And then I remember hearing the shot that hit me and watching as my arm kind of flew through the air and landed on the floor in front of me. And with the shot, it knocked the air out of my lungs. And with that noise came um, him yelling at me to quit my bitching. And I knew that if I didn't play dead, he would shoot me again. So I did I quit breathing and closed my eyes and pretended to be dead, hoping he'd move on, which he did. Thank God. And yeah, it's really intense. So a few minutes later, once I knew that they were far enough away to not see me, just by listening to where they were in the room, I started to look at the damage and I had a four inch hole in the back of my right arm. And the slug from the shotgun completely disintegrated my entire shoulder bones to dust. I mean, just not there anymore. Came out the front, went through my wrist, and then straight, straight across my neck, there was a bullet graze. And I was just trying to stop the bleeding and do anything I could to stay alive. My neck was swelling, it felt hard to breathe. And then a couple minutes after that, I guess the shooters left the library to go to the cafeteria to see why their bombs didn't go off. And it was then that people started running out and telling us that this was our time to get out. And I started yelling for help because I couldn't move my arm at all to get the chair out from beside me. And that's when a boy came, pulled the chair out, pulled me up to my feet. And after another 10 or 15 minutes of running and hiding in various places throughout fields, I ended up in a triage area. Oh my gosh. Well, um, so after it, of course, there was a, a, a long road of uh, not just uh, physical recovery, which um, I, I know one of the things that you, that you talk about that's so important is, is the purpose of, of donation. Um, and when it comes to uh, the medical help that you were able to receive, obviously you needed blood and you were able to have a, a, a bone transplant, some other things. Um, can we touch just on that, what occurred there medically before we talk about the, the, the mental and emotional aspects and, and, and what then you had to, to face at that point? Sure, so in that triage area, um, I knew I was in bad shape and um, I asked an off-duty nurse, are they going to cut off my arm? And she couldn't tell me no. And there was a very real chance that I was going to be a 17-year-old amputee. But doctors met and um, across the nation, really, and came up with this plan. There was a doctor in Denver, who's one of my very best friends still today, um, to use an allograft, which is a cadaver bone, a donated bone. And... We had never heard of such a thing before, but it worked. It saved my arm and it gave me two arms to wrap around my four babies, right? And yeah, this yeah. quality of life that looks very different than if I had been an amputee when I was 17. So definitely tissue donation, bone donation is a huge passion of mine and a lot of why I do what I do to encourage people to know what that looks like. But even though they did save my arm, I never regained full function. Um, it's been an ongoing battle for 21 years. I even had another complete replacement, major surgery just in March a few months ago. So it's never been great, but it's better than it could have been. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad. And it's such a credit to uh, your optimism that, that you see it from that perspective of, of not what I, of being blessed and thankful for what you have and in, in that gratitude. Yeah, I've definitely had to choose that in certain times over life. I mean, there's hard times that I wish I had full function. I wish there's certain things I could do with my kids that I can't. And I really have to battle the frustration and sometimes anger about that, especially because somebody did this to me. It's not like I wore it out playing tennis or something. Like somebody right. did this to my body. Mm -hmm. And it's a lifelong struggle that I'm going to have because of that. But it is a lot about the choice. Well, I mean, I could choose to be mad and angry and frustrated about it, but how productive is that to my quality of life? So I yeah, choose, right. the, choose the other. 
And I think that's so important. I hope people really touch on what you just said there is that it is a choice, that it is our personal perspective of, of gratitude and to, to take a look at what we do have and not what we don't. Right. So how, how then was the recovery process mentally and emotionally for you? Because at this point, you're 17 years old, you just went through the traumas of loss of friends, and now it's friends, fellow students, um, you know, people that were mentors in the school. Um, you know, what, what occurred for you uh, as far as that recovery process? I like to say the mental and emotional recovery was harder than the physical recovery, which was already sure. really hard. <laughs> yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, the physical recovery just was what it was. Like, I felt like I couldn't change it. it. But the emotional recovery, there was, you know, I came to learn that there was so much choice in what I wanted to put my mental and emotional energy toward. But that took years and years and years of healing and learning. I had severe PTSD for mm -hmm. a long time. I mean, to the point of, I just couldn't function. I literally slept on my parents' floor for three months. And then I moved into my sister's room and shared a bed with her for six months after that, because I was so terrified that somebody was going to come finish me off. Mm -hmm. The fact that my parents got me back into a school for my senior year, I think is a miracle because <laughs> I was dead set on never going to a school again. Um, and slowly, I mean, time does help, but it really was a matter of retraining my broken mind and how my broken mind wanted to see things from a panic perspective and a victim perspective and how it just completely is paralyzing to have panic attacks and to live with that kind of fear. And over time, I wanted to take that back. I wanted to take control of my own mind and my own heart back, but I didn't fully know how because it was so strong, the feelings of fear. Um, so it was, it was a lot of training myself in those scary situations or what I thought were scary to step back and see what does everybody else think that I'm obviously not seeing. Everybody else is walking around the grocery store, for example, just getting their groceries and I'm standing here shaking in a mass panic and really there's nothing wrong. So my husband now, Patrick, I was dating him at the time and he was so good at just pulling me back, understanding that he couldn't get in my head, but helping me to see what was actually happening. And the more we practiced that, um, the more my healing came. But I feel like the big aha moment for me was when Sandy Hook happened. Um, that was about 13 years after Columbine. Oh. And I thought I was a baby when I was shot at Columbine. And those were actual babies being shot at school. And I had kids that age at the time. And it was already terrifying for me to send my own kids to school. And then something like Sandy Hook happened. I completely lost it and thought, I'm never leaving the house. Our kids can't go anywhere. I was a mess. And it was kind of in that, over that weekend, I just took a lot of time back for myself to really think about why is this such a problem for me? And I realized that the intentions of the shooters at Columbine were still controlling my life. Their actions and you know, their intentions to haunt my nightmares forever were still happening 13 years after Columbine. And I was sick of it. I was sick of these two boys who were now dead, who already destroyed my body, were still destroying my mind and my heart. Yeah. And I started to think back to the hand that was on me in the library and how in the very worst, most horrific, terrifying moment of my life, that hand brought a peace and a knowing that whether I lived or died, I was gonna be okay. And that hand is with me wherever I go, it's available to me. Why am I choosing the intentions of the boys over the hand that brought goodness in the midst of something so awful? And that was kind of my turning point of, I get to choose. Yes, they did this to me, but I get to choose now. Are they gonna to continue to destroy my life for years and years and impact my kids' lives because of my fear? Or am I gonna turn their evil intentions into something productive and good going forward? And that's, that, that word fear is um, such an important part of, I think from my perspective and, and seeing in the, the mentors that I have of pushing past in life, 
we have so many fears that uh, that hold us back. People uh, often joke with me, "Why why are you so comfortable speaking in front of crowds?" Um, and I and I go, "Well, they say the number one, you know." fear is uh, public speaking number two is death and i'd much rather be giving the eulogy and it was something i think my grandpa said with me so it was uh, as much as i wanted to be out there uh, speaking in front of people i was so afraid to share or tell my story or perspective or whatever else it was and it's just amazing that you you point that out um and i know you do a lot of work with fear when it comes to purpose so let, let's talk about now how you you went and got outside that fear, outside that comfort zone, and, and now you're going out and you're speaking to, to thousands and thousands of people and doing amazing work. Yeah, I think I realized, well, obviously they say how crippling fear is. And I, I started to realize for all those years, I was still surviving. That's right. what I call it. Even 13, 15 years after Columbine, I was still surviving. I was surviving well. You know, I had a nursing career, I had a husband, I had a family, but I wasn't thriving until I was able to release myself from the fear and the grips of that um, angst in my life. When I broke free from that and chose the freedom to live without that, then I started to thrive. And it wasn't until I could thrive that I could really share my story. Um, because I started speaking right after Columbine. I mean, we were thrown into the spotlight we never wanted. The mm -hmm. media was all over us. And I felt obligated to share, but I hated sharing because people pitied me. And that's not why I wanted to share. And right. so it took me so many years to get to the point of being comfortable with my own story that I could give it to others in a positive way and not in a way that I need your pity, you should feel bad for me because all these horrible things have happened to me. That's not how I live. I don't live as a victim that way. And I didn't like people seeing me that way. So finally, I started sharing my story first about tissue donation because my surgeon asked me to. And I thought since he saved my arm, I owed him one. So, <laughs> so I started that way. And, you got um, it, Doc. I know. <laughs> but it was a thousand people. My first you know, real public speaking, there's a thousand people. It was terrifying. And you're an but, introvert. And I'm an introvert. I didn't like all these people looking at me. Um, uh, and I didn't feel like I had anything to give. Real, that's really what it felt like when I started sure. talking. It was like, yeah, I have, I mean, I have this story of horrible things that happened to me. I guess if you want to hear it. But then I realized from the reaction of that crowd, people were so encouraged. And at first I didn't understand why, <laughs> it's just my story. But because people were so encouraged, it started changing my heart and my mind about being that vulnerable. Like it really was never about me. It's vulnerable, vulnerability for the sake of encouraging somebody else through their struggles and to be able to find purpose in their own suffering so that they too can learn to thrive and not simply survive. Yeah. Well, and, you know, that's so important that you point that out because it's such a part of our mission is to bring these stories out of, of folks out uh, from different traumas and, and different adversities because it, I think a lot of stuff that happens, maybe not in your case, Casey, but of course with the, with the folks that we've spoken with uh, concerning addiction, and I know from myself is like a sense of shame and, and things of that nature. And so when we highlight these things, you know, it, it takes away that shame. Um, and and I, I don't know, did you ever go through any of that kind of, of phase? Did you, you just don't, you don't seem like a woe is me kind of person at all, which is so awesome and amazing. And uh, it, it's a strength I'm still trying to find. Um, so it's such a pleasure to talk to you. But, but what was the, the, the transformative stuff that you started to see once you were getting that, your story out there? Well, I think from, as as far as the trauma that I specifically went through, Columbine really started it. There weren't people who had necessarily gone before us and could tell us in five years it might feel like this and you'll still struggle with this and flashbacks might still happen and nightmares. And then at 10 years, this is how I overcame anxiety or whatever. And I felt, you know, obviously these shootings have happened so many more times since Columbine. And I feel like I get to welcome people to this club that nobody signs up for um, and get to 
sound so positive, like, ooh, come join the club. It's not like that. But I feel like it's a privilege to be able to walk people through it, to mentor them through it. But you can't make the connection with other people if you're not willing to give your own story. Mm-hmm. If you're not willing to give your own weaknesses and the things that you've struggled with, it's hard to find or share any strength without that connecting point. The Knocking Doors Down Autobiography by Carlos Vieira. It takes you deep into his destructive past and how racing saved his life and opened the door to give back to the community. And 100% of the sales go directly to the Carlos Vieira Foundation, an organization committed to raising awareness for addiction, mental health, and autism. And for inspiration and motivation, tune in weekly to the podcast every Thursday for real-life episodes from celebrities and local heroes. Get Knocking Doors Down today at kddmediacompany.com or Amazon. Well, I couldn't agree more. And you, and you really are uh, doing such amazing work. And um, can you share your, what your website address is real quick? Because I want to talk about your blog. I've been enjoying them. Oh, you're sweet. It's um, <laughs> CaseyRugsagerJohnson.com. It's really hard to spell. <laughs> I married into a much easier name. <laughs> Um, but yes that's my website it talks about my book over my shoulder and I love love doing the blog I feel like it encourages me a lot and I hope that's what it does for others as they're reading yeah I I highly recommend and uh, you can you can google Casey to get that address that website URL a little bit easier Um, but uh, I have been I I got on and and wanting to learn more about you and and, uh, as I have mentioned a single parent and I just love some of the blogs Um, and one of them I want to talk about that, that you did was filling buckets and building castles and I think it's so important especially for folks that are maybe hearing this and and uh, other parents that are feeling kind of what you have with the shelter in place and just great parenting method. Reading your blog, I can tell you're an amazing mom. Uh, oh. That's all I got to say. I can just tell. Um, but can you talk on that idea of filling buckets and building castles? Because I just love it. Yeah. So we call our hearts in our home, we call it our love bucket. And um, when the kids, you know, as I started sending my kids back to school and realizing that as soon as they leave my care, it's kind of out of my control. And I, that was something I really had to work through, obviously sending them out to school. But what did I have control over? And that was how their hearts were when they left my care. And so if you consider your heart as your love bucket, it's either full or it's empty. And the things that you say or do are either filling somebody's bucket or emptying it out. And so around our table each morning, we talk about, you know, what could you do to fill a bucket today? Oh, you could hold a door for somebody. You could tell somebody you like her shoes, you could compliment. You could help somebody who drops their book. Just something that's a fill to a bucket. But when my kids are fighting, <laughs> I don't care how good a parent anybody is, they're going to fight. You know, we talk about you're emptying that bucket. You're taking things out of that love bucket. And, and what does it make you feel like to know that you're doing that to somebody else's bucket. You're pouring out. And the goal being that when our kids leave the house, their bucket is overflowing. So that what pours out of them onto others is that love and that care for other people. But also knowing that as we put them out into the world, they're gonna come back home having been emptied out, whether that was from a bully at school or just a really hard day keeping up at school or anything. You know, a friend's parent has cancer. I, anything that could empty out their bucket, they can be coming home with an empty bucket. And it's our job and our privilege, really, to fill that bucket back up as parents. And, and realizing, if you like the analogy, that as we're filling buckets, we're building really strong castles so that as we do go out into the world and they get bumped on or rocks thrown at them, it's not going to crumble, but it's going to be able to stand strong. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Well, and you included in there uh, Proverbs twenty two six, which says, says, "Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn away from it." And it's just, uh, it's amazing the work that you're doing because not only in your home, but what you're sharing of what you do. And I highly recommend that, that folks out there, you know, if you are struggling in any sort of way, but go to go to Casey's website and and at least read some of the blogs because it's so well written and thought out. And um, for me, it's just like, okay, I'm looking forward to the next one. I have starred the oh. website. This is going to oh, help. Thank so. you. 
Yeah, and like I was telling you, I, I, I brought this up to my kids and they just looked at me like, Dad, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so. I'm going to bring it up. I'll bring it up to my nephews. You're like, does this involve Fortnite at all? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, what are you hoping once uh, the COVID, the, the shelter in place and stuff, kind of starts to come lifted as far as getting back out there and speaking with with folks? Because again, stuff that you can find out that, that Casey speaks on. I mean, it's everything from your trauma recovery, emotional, physical. Um, you know. The suicide that you've had to face with with friends, um, how to pull the good from negatives. Uh, you know, faith it sounds so incredibly important to you. Um, which uh, anyone that's listening, maybe that's here that that is in recovery from addiction, we know that we are asked to concede ourselves to a higher power, uh, and it's such an important part of that process. So, what what are you, what are you hoping once all this lifts to get back out there and, and do? It's been. Um, really sad for me to not be present at the conferences or the groups that I talk to, small groups, big groups, because that connection piece in person makes such a difference. Um, I mean, I can talk to people on the phone and we can email back and forth and Zoom, but to be in person and really look deep into somebody's eyes and know their pain or be yeah. able to really hear their pain and connect in that way, um, it encourages me as much as I hope it encourages somebody else when we get to do those things in person. So I'm just really excited to get back to the events and mm -hmm. to, to being with people and connecting with people, which has brought so much purpose from my story and hopefully will continue just that line of purpose down through their story and the lives that they touch too. Yeah, yeah it's a, it, it, and for me, I, tell me if I'm wrong. I know for me and continually sharing my story, it's a selflessly selfish and that as I continue to grow and somebody goes, oh, I can so relate and there's connectivity, it, it fills my bucket. Right. You know? <laughs> See, you're using it already. I um, am. I told you this was, <laughs> this stood out. I had to talk to you about this. Yeah. It's, um, it really validates what you're doing. I think when you see somebody encouraged because you were vulnerable or because you reached out and took their hand or even somebody you know, when we're able to do that for others, I'm not very good at accepting help about <laughs> anything. Um, but I've realized I never think that of anybody else who needs that. And so like, like in March, when I had this major surgery, um, and here's all the things I can't do, and I couldn't take care of my kids, and I can't drive, and I couldn't even get myself dressed. And it was so frustrating to me. But people just wanted to help me. And and that's how they were trying to fill my bucket. They were trying to keep me, you know, engaged and encouraged and pushing me through this really difficult recovery. And that's what I'm giving to others. But I also need to be able to accept that myself as I go forward and continue to face, you know, a setback with PTSD or anxiety, which is normal. Um, or feeling overwhelmed with people in my house all the time, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh. Have you struggled with, um, and it was a topic we brought up on a recent episode, was um, the acceptance of, of grace when it comes to yourself, that sometimes having a little bit of grace for yourself can be a huge challenge? Yes, because I have high expectations of myself. I always have. Um, I don't do well with failure, and I've had to learn what is failure and what is a setback, um, right. especially with PTSD, it's huge that a setback doesn't mean I failed, but I now can see it as an opportunity for deeper healing. And it all, that is what I learned when that Sandy Hook moment happened and I totally lost it for that weekend. Sure. It was like I was outside myself thinking, girl, you are out of control. What is the matter with you? Pull it together. I but that only huge imagine. setback, gave me the opportunity to choose letting go of that fear right. that I didn't realize at the time before that, that I was holding on to so much. And it wasn't until that, I guess, setback that I was really able to choose thriving versus surviving. So grace is huge with anybody, anybody you're talking to, especially yourself, starting with yourself, right? When yes. you realize we're not failing, this is all, as long as you're keep making forward progression, even if it's, two steps back and then the next day it's one step forward you're still progressing 
Yeah, I, I've just had to really incorporate that. And, and it ties so much into, uh, you know, and my experiences with fear as well, because it's the fear of failure as opposed to looking at failure as the, the lesson point. I think, Mike, what did I bring up? Uh, I was talking about I had a memory flashback of my kids when they first started walking. And I'm sure you with four, you know, the falling on their bottom, the falling on their face. And eventually then now you see them running and yeah. it's, it's kind of like, well, we give our, them so much grace in this necessary process as a part of human growth. Why can't we continue to do it with ourselves, not just mentally, but emotionally and physically, spiritually, and in every aspect? Right. Yeah. We sometimes expect way too much of ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, okay. Casey, I really want to ask you this, but I didn't want, I don't want to go. Okay. I'm going to ask you this and then okay. know if it's okay or whatnot. All so right. that day when you were looking for your friend to go get, you know, the lunch with your mom and whatnot, where, where was she? Because oh, if, you had, if you had had, or if she was there, you guys wouldn't even have been there. Does that Oh, ever not true. No. Oh, so, I okay. Two things. So Lindsay ended up staying home from school sick that day, Oh. Okay. but you know, at the time we had pagers, so right. she hadn't paged me to let me know that she wasn't coming to school. Sure. Um, but actually, had we met at the locker, we would have been walking out right where the shooting started. Oh, 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 oh I thought you would have been them. gone before the shooting. Oh, so you no. would have, oh, so thank God she was sick. It's like, day. it's just like everything fell into the place right. that I was in that library on that day at that oh, exact yeah. moment. It just, oh, it could have been that, worse yeah. if I hadn't been. And uh, it's just crazy. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and life works that way. And now you're here saving lives, you know, doing the nurse thing. Got I hope so. Kids, great yeah. mom, marry the love of your life. Look at you. Aww. Look at you. I so. guess I'm doing all right, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you know, and, and we just have to say that to ourselves some days, but I, but I, I highly, um, I know I'll speak for Mike, I just commend you with being able to find such strength to, to go out there, to get past that fear, to be our cliche of knocking doors down. Aww. And um, and just build a build a life for you. And of course, as we talk, you know, people are like, "Well, she's got challenge." We all have challenges every day. No one's trying to <laughs> deny that. But uh, right. But it, it was important for us to speak with you because you just became such an example of taking such a tragic situation, looking inward, and despite all the the fears and anxieties and the PTSD that, that that you've just pushed through it and said, "I'm gonna live a purposeful life," which is such a big part of your mission now. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's just, you know, it's a privilege to get to share and, and to know that, you know, grief is such a hard thing, but it's universal, right? It doesn't yeah. matter. You know, some people think they can't relate to me because they weren't shot at school and that's just not true. Like grief is so different, whether it's addiction or the loss of a loved one or um, sickness or trauma like mine, but it's all something needing to be overcome and needing to find purpose from. And I think the more that we all share our stories together, the more healing will come to ourselves and to others um, mm -hmm. through that connectivity. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Casey? No, I think you guys run a great program. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm like so honored that you had me on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, and the book, of course, available through your website. Uh, I recommend people uh, Googling Casey. It's a little bit easier than spelling spelling yes. your, your, your name all the way through. But um, uh, is the book Over My Shoulder also available on other outlets or just through your website? Yes. Over My Shoulder is available um, on Amazon and Barnes & Noble as well. Okay.